My name is Mike Kamansky. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about design leadership uh, and the struggle bus. Um, we'll get to what I mean by the struggle bus, but it's pretty apparent, right? Like trying to be a design leader, like how to do everything right, like what is it you're supposed to be doing? Uh, why is it that when I try to do a certain thing, it always fails? Like, there's a lot of, like, it's just struggle there. Um, but I'll start a little bit with kind of my background in design. So in the beginning, it was me, maybe one other guy. And we'd be part of the name house design team or a freelance project or whatever it was. And we did everything. We did illustrate, do photography, websites, t-shirt design, physical products, never really got into software back then, and just made things. People came to you with a problem, you solved it as quickly and uh, efficiently and with as much craft as possible. Um, that, was, that was my design career up until about six years ago. Um, I, uh, I worked with a, a lot of uh, cool uh, smaller companies. One was a flower shop, believe it or not, it was like kind of national. It's a, a lot of really random stuff there, product photography even. Um, moved into a dental marketing agency, which was awful, but a really good experience about like how to, how to turn around um, just a lot of content really quickly. Uh, we had a lot of clients. Um, they all had like their own needs. Uh, dentists are very, um, in general, are very assured of who they are and what they want. So like trying to navigate them through the process and kind of teach them um, about like design and balance and the fact that not everybody wants to see an extracted tooth in their logo. Um, but you learn things about the industries that you're in. Uh, from there I went to Ragnar and I worked there for a couple years, almost three years, uh, as, as like the design team with the copywriter. That was a fantastic job. Um, one of the interesting things you learn from being in small companies, uh, especially product companies like Ragnar, is um, a lot of really odd skills that don't apply to to uh, design at all. So in their case, uh, the design team was all required to go out to events and you would like help lead volunteers. There's nothing about that in design, but you're working with people and teaching them how to solve a problem. Um, that there's something very applicable to that in design. So what is the problem? How do we solve that? How do we teach other people how to solve it? Um, and then I went through kind of a rebirth. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> while at Ragnar, um, I, uh, I was doing freelance. I always do freelance stuff on the side just to keep um, things interesting. Um, I feel like the more uh, creative activities you can have your hands in, the better problem solving you can be for any given situation. Um, yeah, random things always apply. You can be working on, uh, like right now I'm working on a question and answer app that applies nothing at all to my normal day job, but just because I'm working through different UI patterns, um, I'm able to take that learning and apply it back to um, problem solving for like my current day job. So this rebirth happened through a freelance job. And I had a friend, uh, Caleb Ogden, who used to, well, he's back out here now. Um, he reached out to me at a startup, or he's part of a startup, and we're like, hey, we need some branding work. He's like, cool, let's do this branding work. And they had me doing stuff like, well, we kind of have our logo finalized, so here's the logo. You can work on an icon if you want, um, but we really want some stationery. I was like, cool, let's make some stationery. And I got him the stationery, and it was just like, here's the actual artifact, right? Here's a letterhead, there's an envelope, there's a business card. But through this, I, uh, I remember the conversation very clearly. It was like, 
here's the stuff, like, I feel like this will work really well for you, but you know you're doing this wrong, right? This whole branding thing? And that's a really weird question to ask somebody who's employed. You know you're doing this wrong, right? It's probably not the best way to approach something, but I knew I was right, and I knew that there was a better way to apply this new brand they were trying to craft to what they were doing. Um, and from that little bit of courage and sanity, whatever it was, uh, they flew me out for a week. And I worked on marketing stuff, uh, and worked on fleshing out the brand and everything, and I thought it was just a cool like week-long gig, and I was just gonna go hang out, and at the end of the week, they ended up offering me a job. Um, so, that was back plane. Uh, <laughs> But back then, because nobody ever understands what you're saying, what you're talking about. Um, it's, a, it's a social network that died. Um, unless you're like a, a Lady Gaga fan, you've probably never heard about it. Um, but my official job title there was, make the office cool enough that we can hire top tier engineers. So they didn't actually care about like my design skills so much. They just wanted to attract other people. There's a power in design there um, to get a message across, to have a professional appearance, to have a cool appearance. Like that's design leadership a little bit. Like you're able to express the voice of the company through whatever it was. Like um, I happen to do a couple of murals on the walls, like use spray paint, all that kind of stuff. Not remotely um, computer related at all. But through that, like. Um, Built a really good relationship with the uh, engineers there, and um, was eventually introduced into UX and UI. Uh, up till then, like I kind of did UX, nobody really had a term for it um, in, in my line of work. But um, if you think about problem solving um, as what user experience is, then uh, it's just a good path to get through there. So I wasn't hired to do UX, so I wasn't hired to do UI, but there was only like one and a half designers, and they just had too much to do. So I put in extra hours to get my, uh, my, my day job of making things cool done, and then I, uh, I would jump in, and I would start making UI and UX stuff. So this is one of my first projects. This is a profile, like a profile modal uh, for that product, and uh, it, was, it was a really good experience. Um, so the transition from branding into UX, just by taking initiative, um, was was that that leap. Um, so that plan led me to Clary, another two-man team, um, hired mostly for UI, but ended up doing a lot of UX there as well. Um, it was a very it was a difficult place for me to work. Um, the designer I was with was a really talented designer. He really pushed me. Um, and that was hard. Uh, being constantly asked, like, why is that there? What does that do? How did the user get there? Like, if you've been doing this for a while, you know that's what you need to be asking all the time. But when you're learning it, it's really hard. But it's good to be pushed. Like, it's good to find those mentors. It's good to find those people in your life that will ask you those questions and keep constantly challenging you. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a really tough job for me, but I loved it. Like, I ended up, like, I, I know I wouldn't know what I know now or be where I am without that particular job or that particular individual. So, definitely uh, find those people in your life. Um, the nice thing about them challenging you is you make a better product and you also make yourself better. Um, and then you can turn around and put that back out to the people around you. All right, so now, why did it take me so long to get to now? This is a pretty long intro, right? Eh? Now, I currently work for the LDS Church in the uh, user experience department. Um, I've been here almost two years. Uh, I had a couple, like, a pseudo interview. Um, it went really well, met uh, a designer or two. Um, and then I eventually had a really awkward phone interview it was like, this is never going anywhere. Um, but somehow I got a call. So I came, out, came back out from California and 
had a personal interview where I had to give another presentation, but was not this terrified, but still slightly terrified. And um, didn't really know what I was going to do, but decided to walk in and just be confident about it. Like, I know who I am, I know what I can do, and I'm just going to tell people what it is, and if that's good enough, that's good enough. If not, then I'll find out what it is I need to do to make that next step. So, obviously I got the job, because that's where I work now. But there was this caveat. I didn't know I was hired as a lead designer. <laughs> that was a little weird. Um, fortunately, it was me and one other designer, and it was a little bit weird anyway, because uh, <laughs> I didn't have NDAs to even work on the project that I was assigned to, so. But there's that discovery moment of like, oh, I'm this thing, I have to like live up to this thing. I think we, as designers, we all have that. Like, there's an expectation of what we know, what we can provide. Um, I didn't know I was gonna be design lead. Uh, I didn't have that much background in UX, UI design. I had zero uh, background in telling people what to do, I guess, is like what, what everybody thinks a lead is, right? Like, I gotta do this, you gotta do it this way but that's not really what it is. Um, and then you get into situations where you're like, ah, I'm an imposter syndrome, I'm an imposter. Right? You get the imposter syndrome, right? Like, they're gonna realize I don't know what I'm talking about any minute and I'm gone. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about that. There's a lot of really good talk about imposter syndrome. Um, it's definitely a real thing. Um, my biggest advice is do some research, talk to people about it. Um, join Product 5 on Slack, throw your questions out there and realize that um, everybody has these same misgivings, everybody is growing, everybody is trying to learn something new. Um, from the outside looking in, people have it really put together, but we all know that we don't have it that well put together. Um, so, it's been two years, I'm still figuring out that role, I, uh, I hope I'm doing okay, a lot of the people I work with are here. I got a thumbs up, so that's good. <laughs> um, so now what? Bob continues to teach, right? We don't make mistakes, we make happy accidents. We learn from them and we move on. John uh, <laughs> Vito, right? Like, Bob taught us every Saturday morning after cartoons were over, and we just didn't want to get off the couch still. But, these happy accidents are the ways that we learn and that we progress. Um, I, I don't know, I just love something about that. Like, if, if you can make a mistake and not let it paralyze you and move forward, um, that's not the battle, it's just being able to move forward. Um, so, what's with all this backstory and where do we go from here? Um, it all comes back around, but Basically, it just lets you know I'm not an expert. I'm figuring this out just like everybody else. Um, so I thought I would bring up uh, some people that I do consider experts, and I just randomly chose a few people. Um, feel free to yell out feedback if you agree or disagree with any of these choices. I'm totally okay with that. Um, so first up, we'll go with somebody pretty well known, Dieter Rams. So, I wish I had known about this guy when I was uh, a little bit earlier on in my career. Ten principles for good design. Um, not that this is well laid out, I feel like <laughs> this slide could use some help. It's not going to stand the test of time. But the products do. Why is Dieter inspirational as a design leader? Dieter loved design so well and wanted his things to not be thrown away. Um, then he asked himself, is my design good design? And he figured out this 10 principles for how to figure out if it's good design. Um, I'm not gonna go through those right now. Definitely check it out if you haven't before. Um, it's well worth your time. There's a lot of posters. This is kind of like a design meme for a little while. Um, but I, I think he had these principles, he applied them, and we have artifacts of his work, it was good work. He had, he had care for his craft. Um, 
Next up, Debbie Millman. Um, pretty inspirational. Um, I, I threw a couple of my favorite quotes from her. I feel like these are a great example. Um, I'm not that good, I'm just really unwilling to give up. That's, that's leadership right there, It's just moving forward. Seek out criticism. Find those people that are going to challenge you and move, help you move forward. Um, this last one, it's a little bit longer, but I love this because um, I think we have these mental models of like, of like the perception of what we should be. We don't have to be that. We can be what we want to be and be what we know we can be. So nobody told me that I couldn't do something. Nobody told me that I couldn't succeed. I convinced myself and lived in that self-imposed reality. I think a lot of people do this. I would totally agree with that. Um, definitely check her out on the Design Matters podcast. Um, there's a lot of inspiration content there. Did anybody disagree with any of these so far? Okay. The next one maybe tricky. Dan Petty. Um, Interesting guy, pretty controversial in the design world. Uh, he's uh, outspoken, um, influences as big as Dieter or Debbie, um, but he's trying, right? He's, uh, he's very passionate about design and uh, trying to figure out ways to strengthen people in the community. Um, through conferences, he has this, the, the freelance project that he put up. Uh, that's worth looking at. He also does the web blog. So he's passionate about it. He's doing the best he can to inform people about that passion. Ben Klein, getting a little bit smaller. Local design hero. Uh, not from Utah, but in Utah. And he's working hard to kind of put Utah on the map as design a design hub. Like, we all know that there's a strength here. Uh, there's a lot of talent here. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of marketing and somebody being a little bit outspoken to let everybody else know. Part of that leadership is the quality that he puts into his products. So if you go check out Go Rally and um, their products, like, uh, I pulled this National Geographic one because it was, it was something I, I really liked when it came out. And yes, it's got a little bit of skewmorphism going on, but it doesn't matter, it's still a good design, it's still a good experience. Um, this is the last one I'm going to pull up, but Ed Peck. Design leader in our, in our little circle here, right? Woo. Right? Yeah, round of applause for Peck. <laughs> so he's not doing product hype alone. Um, there's a team of people doing that. but. Where would we be without Ben and this team? We wouldn't be here, would we? Like, would we have these events? Would we be in this environment where we can all learn together and grow? Like, that's a great example of design leadership. Um, and just think of the impact of that on your life, if, if you actually get anything out of this talk. Um, I don't know, I just think that's amazing. Like, the passion's there, like, um, with this example, like he doesn't really get anything from what I know out of this other than just the benefit of having this move forward and strengthening this community um, and making these connections. Um, I don't know, I'm really impressed by that. So, design leaders, why do we care? These people are all bigger than us, right? Like, they all have greater influence than us, they're all better designers, maybe. Um, maybe they're not. But, what do they all have in common? None of these people is your boss, your manager, your, your higher up of any kind. They're all just people who are passionate about this work, who want to teach it, and they're doing it in the best ways that they know how. Um, so, Dieter, principals out there, trying to get everybody like, hey, this, this can really help you. It's something that we can all do. Um, Debbie Milner's just example of, like, I'm just not gonna give up. That's something we can learn from. That's design leadership right there. Uh, Dan, Ben, same thing. 
there's a lot of honorable mentions that can go out. Um, <coughs> there's people in your organization that are these design awards. There's people here. Um, reach out, ask them questions. Maybe find find somebody that you want want to track their uh, um, like what they're doing, how they're doing, how they're inspiring people. Um, so from here, uh, I um, had the opportunity to like kind of plan for this talk, and I reached out to a few designers to ask them. What does a design leader mean to you? Um, I got some interesting responses back. So this is Amy and Jen Hood from uh, Hood's Pod Design. Uh, they responded, great, I'm grateful that they did. Um, setting healthy boundaries with my client. Taking time to learn mutual goals between creative and client. Caring enough to suggest better alternatives when I think a client request isn't best for the desired outcome. Encouraging and rating my design team, making a compelling case for why my team's solution meets the goals of the project. Taking responsibility for mistakes, looking to understand, withholding judgment. Um, and I've gone through all these and I've tried to break them down into like the attributes that I think we can model ourselves after um, and, try, and try to move forward. So the key points I got out here is like taking this time to learn. Um, this is like really learning about who you are, who your client is, uh, maybe the people you're working with, how you all communicate, how to connect with things <coughs> together. Um, uh, what do we got here? Uh, next is caring. So I always relate that back to authentic. Um, authentic is a word that gets thrown around a lot. Um, it's kind of a buzzword, but like if you can unpack the, the buzziness out of that and actually connect with like who you really are, actually caring about the process and the people around you, not just about what's in it for you, um, that gets you into this, this situation where you can suggest better alternatives. Um, encouraging. Uh, everybody likes somebody who's positive. Nobody, nobody likes to work with somebody who's constantly negative all the time. Um, they're understanding and they're non judgmental. Um, nobody really likes judgment. Uh, we all do it to ourselves. Um, hard enough anyway, we're all on our own worst right? Um, cool. So next up, um, it's Kurt Madsen. Uh, I've known Kurt forever, and I started working together back at back so it's been four or five years. Um, I've really grown to respect him. Um, and he says, someone who has the soft skills to navigate the people side of things, the talent to deliver and back up their ideas, <coughs> and the trust in the team to let them succeed on their own and own their own successes. Um, so breaking this down, uh, I feel like soft skills is a little bit of a buzzy word right now, but it's a big topic. Um, I encourage you to go find a list of soft skills, figure out what those are, maybe rank yourself um, against the, this list, and I'll touch on a few more of these later as well. But compare and figure out where you can go with that. Um, I love that he called out trust. Um, you need to trust the people you work with around you. And when you give that trust, you get that trust back. Um, and you're able to have an open dialogue and move forward with those things. Um, and then this piece about and own their own successes. Um, you need to be honest and you need to have integrity. Like, uh, yeah, it's, it's business, yeah, it's a doggy dog world, but like, you can only burn so many bridges and get so far. But if you can, you're in a position and you're able to give somebody credit for something, that looks as good on you as it does for the other person. Um, and it never comes back around to bite you. Somebody's like, oh, I totally did that and they took credit for it. Uh, Nick, um, a design leader to me is one that makes mistakes and learns. One who gets dirty and not just bosses around. I've always admired the people I've worked with that didn't treat their leadership as just a position. It was more of a spot where they wanted to learn and teach. That's what's very important. So, design leaders, they make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Like, leadership isn't about being perfect. Um, they do the work. Uh, just because you're trying to be a design leader doesn't mean passing 
the work that you don't want to do off to somebody else. Um, I'm a, a big design lead or whatever where I'm at, and I manage, I help you manage a UI kit. And part of that is just getting down into Sketch and making symbols and trying to pass those out. It's pretty tedious work. Some people would see it as grunt work, but I feel like it's important. Um, and I don't feel like anybody's above that. Um, I mean, if, if it came up, like, I could go back and do something that I did 10 years ago. Sure, I'll clip out images for this product if you need to. Um, uh, he says it's just a position. Um, it's not just a position, but something that they can do to, to help encourage people. Um, and then you have that learning and teach again. Um, the last person was uh, Chantal. She's actually here. Hey, Chantal. And uh, she kind of responded, um, I think someone that keeps pushing for improvement in design, in their own development, and in the development of others. They don't settle. Um, I love this. The pushing for improvement. Um, I think you can't let yourself settle. You shouldn't let the other people around you settle. Um, there's situations where you work with somebody and they're like, I really don't like this. It's hard. How do you help them figure out how it's not, how do you teach them, how do you encourage them? Um, how, if you don't like it, how do you encourage yourself even to like work a little bit harder on it? And this, this, uh, this piece of uh, not settling as well. Um, it's really easy to be like, eh, I've got a couple hours into this, this is good enough. Um, sometimes there's a better idea. Sometimes somebody will challenge you with, with an idea that throws out all the work that you spent a couple hours on, or a couple of days on, or a week or two on, but that idea is better. And you don't have to settle on what you already did just because of the time spent. The idea is to make something better. I like it, there is one more. Um, so you guys may know Mark. Uh, he says, design leaders do whatever it takes to elevate the team and puts the ego aside at all times. Providing the tools, time, and cover so the team can do the best work educating the board on the role and importance of design, and fighting like mad to ensure the salaries and roles for design and research are represented in a meaningful way, not just title of the role and role models. Um, so this one gets into a little bit of like actual management, uh, which I'm not covering so much, but I, I believe those are important pieces. Um, so I just call out these few things to do whatever it takes. Um, sometimes you get asked to do a project. If you don't have that skill set, figure out that skill set. Um, that's outside work time, that's on the bus, thinking about it, in the shower, um, trying not to completely distract your boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or whoever with these random thoughts about this silly project you're working on, but still just kind of thinking through it. Um, they elevate, so another, another uh, dig for um, positivity there, um, puts their ego aside. Um, I think. That's an awesome one. Working with egos is really hard. Um, when I, I, one of my past jobs, I worked with a couple of engineers, and I'm really good friends with them. So, I, but it, like it took a little while to get through because um, they were young and they were pretty arrogant, and they thought they were hot stuff working in California and at a tech startup or whatever else. And you'll always run into these people. Um, they're hard to work with. And that makes it hard to make a good product. Um, and it's, it's hard to lead that way when you just have that ego and you're just swinging things around like nobody wants to work with. Um, and the particular individual that I'm, I'm, like, I'm kind of thinking of, like he learned that too, he's actually really good to work with. It's kind of just a learning curve. Like we all grow through these things. Um, and again, he talks about educating and fighting for what's right. You just kind of stick it up. Um, so, from there, I have a couple um, kind of attributes. Um, this kind of touches back on the, the soft skills that, that I mentioned before, but I just kind of want to work through. Um, so, the first one is, uh, is humility. And uh, I don't know why this example popped into my head, but be like Benedict Cumberbatch at the end of the movie. Uh, Sherlock, 
starts out the series, he's kind of a jerk, everybody knows he's a jerk. He's still kind of a jerk if you're still watching the series. But he knows that he's better with his team. And he knows his team, he knows their strengths, and he relies on their strengths to get him through to the right answers. That's good leadership right there. He's, there's still some personality flaws there, we all still have them, but it's a pretty good example. Uh, the second picture is Alan Turin, Turin from uh, Imitation Game. Uh, certifiable genius, knew he was right, knew the thing that he was trying to build would solve the problem. How to stop the Germans, right? How to crack this code. But he couldn't get there by himself. And he, he had to learn how to communicate with the people around him and humble himself to know like, hey, I really do need these people for him and the team to actually be able to crack the code. Uh, and then Dr. Strange, um, pretty arrogant doctor at the beginning, right? Didn't want to do anything that didn't show that he was the most amazing person in the world. And he had like a perfect track record too, so he didn't want to touch anything that was a potential failure. So there's no humility there. There's no room for growth. And he had to be completely broke down and built back up to where he was more effective. Um, Forbes recently put out an article just last September called Humility, Your New Key Business Asset. Um, you catch these soft skill things, they're uh, really heavy in the business world right now, but totally crosses over to design. Um, uh, I just pulled a couple quotes. Um, and this first one was like a quote with a quote inside of it. Um, so it's culture eats strategy for breakfast. I like to add humility makes the best utensil. So um, you can have a strategy, but if your culture is kind of broken, um, it doesn't really matter. If you can get um, people to, to have humility, to be a little bit more humble, then you get that breakfast. You get that strategy done. Uh, the second one, humility and a lack of self-entitlement are not only correlated or indirectly associated with success in an organization, they are causative. Humility often creates a path for success. Um, hey, we're all here, like what is design leadership? Uh, what is our path to success? What is the path of the thing that we're working on? What is that success? This applies to both. Um, yeah, so yeah, be humble, that's awesome. Next up, um, articulate. Using words well, words are good, right? Um, I love this quote, um, this is from Ian Armstrong. He put out an article a little while ago, uh, Soft Skills in UX Design Leadership. This is a good article, go check it out. Uh, it says the biggest thing someone can do in the pursuit of career development, excuse me, is to work on the articulation skills. The more eloquent the description of your approach, the better the feedback you get becomes. The loop forms a basis for increasingly accurate self-assessment and more rapid personal and professional growth. Uh, I can't recommend this more. Um, it's, it's one thing to be in the industry and know the buzzwords. It's another thing to know what those buzzwords mean and how to explain them to somebody who's not in the industry. Um, If you can build those big bridges and connections, and like a lot of the terms that we use are really ambiguous, right? Um, can't think of anything off the top of my head, but getting people on the same page is really important in uh, problem solving and like having this this move of leadership um, with design. Uh, he has great great feedback there. When polishing my own process articulation, I found. It's useful to talk about it in design communities and take the feedback to the office or to private clients and experiment with the approach. Um, that is an awesome idea. Uh, I think all of us are probably multiple Slack instances. If you're not, there's a ton of things out there. Uh, and in a design system Slack, and in the product have Slack, we have our corporate Slack. There's people talking back and forth, and you can always drop ideas like, hey, how do you guys explain this to people? What does this mean to you guys? Whatever. Like, there's always somebody out there who's willing to like bow. Next up, the design leader. Be proactive. Uh, sorry, this is the closest gift I can think of. It's Justin Bieber. 
Right. So, uh, you can't be a design leader and be the person who just sits and waits for somebody to tell you what to do. It's really important to motivate yourself to get out there and be doing something. Uh, if you have questions, go find those answers. Ask the people who know. Set up meetings, make phone calls. Uh, do the research you need. Learn that skill that you need to do the, the project a little bit better. Um, like you can't just sit back and wait for things to happen. Um, I have an example of one of my coworkers, um, uh, Todd, he's actually here. And it's one of my favorite examples. I think of this a lot recently. But through being proactive, he's working with clients. These clients have their business needs. And they're like, hey, we want this. And he's very good about like, okay, cool. I understand what you guys want. That's great. I'm gonna go build that for you, but, I'm, but he's also going to build what he feels like is the best solution. This is being proactive in that situation. It's hard, it's hard to just be like, the other way to handle that is the client gives you this and you're like, it's dumb. Clients are not gonna respond well to that. Well to that. They feel like you're being antagonistic. The proactiveness here of doing the extra work to do that extra prototype or whatever it is to sell to the client helps build that bridge and builds that trust. So, small pause to talk. Uh, next up is accountability. <coughs> Own what you do and or give credit to those who do have the ownership. Uh, don't be this guy. Don't be running away from responsibility. Uh, it's, uh, it's easy to do when it's good news, right? Like, it's easy to own that. Man, I totally did that. Thanks. It's hard to do when it failed. But it's just as important to own. And that, that ownership of that mistake of failure helps build trust. People know you weren't going to just pass the buck off onto somebody else. With that ownership and that accountability, come with a plan. How do we learn from this failure? How do we move forward? Um, the other thing to do with accountability, don't blame other people. Um, nobody loves that. It's, you ever been in a meeting where somebody just totally like throws somebody under the bus? And you're just kind of like, how is she? Like, it's pretty apparent to know this. Um, uh, I found a cool definition of this is, um, of blame anyway. It's a way to discourage pain and discomfort. And um, from Brene Brown, her uh, take on that is, we just need you to be authentic and real and say, hey, we're sorry for this. Um, I thought that was really cool. Say so, yeah, I'm uh, And then vulnerability. Uh, one of my favorite talks, and I watch it like probably once a year, is the talk um, by Brene Brown on vulnerability, and the power of being vulnerable, um, there's a lot of soft skills I could go through, um, but this is the one that I feel like encompasses the most. Just being willing to put yourself out there. Um, it's, it's hard, it's scary, but the benefits are really, really big. Um, a couple of quotes from Brene to kind of um, sell this a little bit. So the willingness to do something where there are no guarantees, this is fundamental. Um, we do a lot of work learning stuff. Uh, we can go build a project just for fun, and it's probably maybe not going to go anywhere, but the learning involved in building that and the problem solving will help you out in the future. Um, it's not time wasted, as long as you learn something. This, this one quote is like all those quotes about failure, about like, fail fast and move forward. Like, this is, this is what that's getting at. Vulnerability is not a weakness. It has a, a negative connotation of like, um, and maybe this is just like on the male side of things from, from like my perspective, that failure means you're weak. Failure 
only means you're weak if you get up and you never get back up again. So strength comes from keep moving forward, not being weak. Vulnerability is a birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. Uh, so you have all those crazy ideas in your head. You're sitting in a, in a design meeting uh, with, with uh, some fellow designers, or maybe just some business people if you're there by yourself. You got some random ideas, just let them out. Like, hey, what if we tried this? Those are the things that are a little bit vulnerable, and you're like, ah, I didn't say that, it's stupid. But you get it out there, and it'll spark something in somebody else. And the next thing you know, you're at a, a new design. Um, start the conversations. Uh, try to look through things through the eyes of other people. Um, adaptability to change is all about vulnerability. I think this one's interesting in our, uh, in our field of work, um, at least with UX. UX wasn't a thing, really. Like it, It's been around for a while, but it wasn't like a buzzword thing until you know, five years ago or whatever. Uh, and that's moving into like product design uh, because regular people don't know what user experience is. Like, what are we actually going to be in, in five years? Um, and what do we need to like stay relevant? So the, the vulnerability to know, like, I don't know everything right now, but I can continue to learn. Um, so final thoughts. <laughs> so all of the struggle bus, right? Um, whatever that bus looks like to you. Uh, is it this wreck of a bus? Um, is it? Is it maybe this? Um, you kind of the edge a little bit, but there's a way to get back up. Right? The, the tow truck can come get you. Or are we? Uh, are we going full bore? <laughs> uh, just to really push yourself and um, and just enjoy the struggle. Enjoying struggle is a weird thing, but being uncomfortable is a good thing. Being uncomfortable pushes you to try, to learn, to figure out how to be, un or to get to the comfortable spot. Um, I feel like comfortable is boring. Uh, it's stale. Um, constantly pushing yourself and putting yourself into situations is always going to help you out. To be able to do so the struggle was right here. That's what I've got. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Like I said, I'm not an expert, but I can make stuff up. <laughs> cool. Uh, I'm at RipwardDK on like everything, so feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, uh, Instagram. Um, I just like making stuff, I like having conversations around this kind of thing. I think as a community, uh, we can all strengthen each other and learn through this, um, be more humble, allow ourselves to be more vulnerable as an industry, um, just as individuals. Yeah, thanks.